thank you very much everyone for coming i'm going to be actually uh, picking up um, where I left off the last time I gave a talk at T2F, which was almost five years ago. Um, about five years ago, when Sabine was still here, um, I, my uh, book, The Long Partition, had come out of a year or two before that. And um, I had, it was my first opportunity to talk about that work. Uh, with friends and um, and an audience in Karachi. So it, um, I'm going to pick up from that um, and um, um, talk about um, some questions that emerged from that work, The Long Partition. Um, it was a, when I finished The Long Partition, I really wanted to put um, partition well behind me, not work on anything related to it for a while. It had been a huge and emotionally draining project. So um, I really thought I wouldn't work on anything related to partition. But um, as it so happens, it's such a huge experience um, that um, I think this region uh, has, has still a long way to go in terms of reckoning with it, in terms of uh, understanding it, making sense of it. And I almost sometimes wish that uh, we had another word for this experience called partition, something that would allow us uh, like uh, what the Palestinians call the Nakba, the catastrophe, uh, or what the, the, the Jews call the Holocaust, like something that would help us um, think about this experience, not just in terms of the separation, a territorial separation, but rather in the fullness of all the philosophical and political questions that this experience, is, this experience raises for us in understanding. Um, the world we live in today. Um, I'm going to need my glasses for reading some parts. But I'm going to move between uh, uh, reading some uh, parts from, my, from, from this project that I'm doing, uh, that I'm going to be sharing with you, which is really uh, uh, being moved and mobilized by uh, the extraordinary violence that is being unleashed against minorities, um, groups of people that are, that, that are deemed minorities in both India and in Pakistan. Um, Hazara Shias, Ahmadiyas, the lynching and, po and pogroms against Muslims in India, Christians, I mean, you know, you, you, you all know this backdrop, right, better than I do. So um, in trying to uh, write about, uh, as a historian, uh, understand what is it that we continuously have so much violence against minorities? Why um, are minorities, even when they are so small, so uh, seemingly insignificant, right, to the power and politics of the nation state, that there is so much violence directed against, against, um, against uh, these categories of people called minorities. Um, that I started working on a project with a friend of mine who works on Muslims in India. And uh, we call this project Black Margins, uh, Marginalia on the India of Indian history as a way to grapple with um, some of the enduring questions, um, conceptual um, categories that continue to uh, be very powerful in our political um, world today. So I'm going to lay out for you some of the ways in which we're thinking about this project. Uh, and then share with you a small piece from it um, in more detail. Now, in this project, we see the violence against minorities in both Pakistan and India 
as not separate, rather as inseparable. The violence against minorities that takes place in India and the violence that takes place against minorities in Pakistan, we see them as generated by a shared historical logic. Um, and another aspect of this project is that we also see um, the two, you know, while we know that there are two separate nation states, one called India, one called Pakistan, one could say created both by pens and knives, both by bureaucratic power as well as military force, right? There are two states, uh, nation states, India and Pakistan. But we also simultaneously think of India and Pakistan as concepts, as conceptual categories. And as conceptual categories, they exceed often the limits of the nation state itself. Um, and they are constantly being made and contested and refashioned as concepts. What does it mean? What's, what should be in it? What shouldn't be in it? Et cetera, et cetera. So as, as a set of ideas, uh, they, they uh, are, of course, related to draw upon, you know, they're not completely disconnected from the nation state, but they, they were, they, that we can imagine uh, those uh, people imagine uh, and, and contest and, and, and think of those categories in ways that is, is, is more expansive than just the nation state itself. Thirdly, we think of uh, Pakistan as a profoundly Indian concept. Now, uh, as I say this, um, I um, am aware that that there might, you know, I, I, that there might be um, some discomfort uh, uh, from an audience here to to think about it in this way. In fact, uh, in other places too, where I've made that argument, I've got a lot of pushback. So um, I'm putting it out there, and, and I'd love more conversation on it. To think about Pakistan as a profoundly Indian concept, arguably a minority concept, that has and continues to shape the category India, the conceptual category India. Now, every time Muslim neighborhoods in an increasingly ghettoized Indian cities are called mini Pakistans. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that they are drawing on this conceptual category. This, Pakistan is a conceptual category and giving it meaning. So this is what I mean that the conceptual category, right, works um, and is mobilized um, and acquires meaning in many different ways that exceed the nation state. Now, one could also call this conceptual category a civilizational category, which is to say when Indian civilization is invoked as history or practice or ideas, we must ask how the category Pakistan came to be produced within it. Within it, okay, and that's, that's really uh, important uh, here. The rather long and contradictory history of turning profound intimacy into foreignness, of turning the self into the other, this is what we mean by uh, Pakistan as a category being produced within the category of or um, uh, uh, as a Indian civilizational category, right? So it's a process. We think of this as a, as a long historical and, and a complicated process by which intimacy becomes foreignness, the self becomes the other. We could also call it a pariah history, um, but I don't want to use the word pariah loosely because in some respects, I want to lay claim, and especially uh, the piece I'm going to uh, lay before you, the insurrectionary history of Dalit thought um, as integral to the conceptual category, be it India or be it Pakistan. Okay, so what do I mean by insurrectionary? I mean something that, that rises up, revolts, critiques, 
um, and 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 uh, um, uh, is uh, questioning um, whatever is the dominant flow of things. Um, I am going to presume that we're also familiar with the category Dalit, right? It's the yeah, okay. Um, in some respects, I'm 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 uh, uh, responding to existing writing. Um, for example, Faisal Devji's book, Muslim Zion, um, and, and a few other books that have been written recently about Pakistan, which think of Pakistan as a conceptual category, as a political form, as a set of ideas, right, that need to be thought about in relation to its global history. Um, so, uh, um, I'm drawing upon, and, and I don't want to go into too much here because if you're, if you're not familiar with some of these books, it, it makes less sense. But if anyone is interested in Q&A, we can, we can explore uh, what some of those other writings are doing and um, how we may think about that work. Okay, so um, I um, uh, began to think about, as I said, um, Dalit thought, being important to me, I began to think about Pakistan as a conceptual category um, and how one might uh, 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 grapple with uh, its history, um, the history of it as a concept, um, through a text, uh, and I've brought that text with me today. Uh, I photocopied in it in Karachi University Library. It's called um, Pakistan or the Partition of India. Um, the, the first edition was called Thoughts on Pakistan. It's a text written by Ambedkar. Now I'm going to assume everyone knows who Ambedkar was, uh, the uh, leader of uh, uh, Dalits, a Dalit leader, and a, a man who went on to write the Constitution of India, right? Um, and so there's a lot of writing on Ambedkar. Of course, he's, he's a formidable and very important figure of Indian history. Almost all of it is on his mobilization for rights for Dalits um, as a Dalit leader, and then a lot of it is on his writing of the Indian Constitution. But all of Almost all of that work neglects this text that he wrote, Thoughts on Pakistan. Now, Thoughts on Pakistan um, is an incredibly important um, a book um, for thinking about Pakistan, but I, I uh, don't know how many people in Pakistan have really read or grappled with that, what, that book. Um, and uh, it's it's uh, and uh, it's a text that um, was very influential in shaping what happened. Now it's a text that was written in response to the Lahore Resolution. The Re Lahore Resolution, of course, we know, was passed in March, uh, 1940, and. Ambedkar almost immediately after the resolution came out was writing this, this book. And by the end of the year, by November, December, this book was out. And uh, it was a reading of the Lahore resolution. I wrote an op-ed piece uh, in March this year for Dawn, which is about the Lahore resolution and Ambedkar's reading of it. So I don't want to repeat some of that what I wrote, in, uh, wrote for Dawn about it. But I think what's really important about this text is, is that it's a very particular reading of the Lahore Resolution, uh, which is a, a resolution full of ambiguities, but he takes it apart through all the political science of his times. It becomes so important and influential that even Jinnah refers to it. Um, and um, in recent years, in the last five years or so, this book has made a huge comeback in India from very important uh, scholars like Partha Chatterjee uh, to the RSS have been celebrating this text uh, for um, being um, prescient, or rather like anticipating the unfolding of uh, partition as it would happen. My argument, as I have written in, in the Dawn op-ed piece too, and as part of this larger work, is that 
we can't just see it as already anticipating what would happen, but rather this text actually participated in what happened in the years that followed between 1940 and the f eventual, eventually 1947. But because this book has made such a huge comeback, right? people are reading it and writing about it and celebrating it, that it becomes really even more important that we uh, begin to examine what this text has to say. What, what is it doing? What kinds of ideas it's putting forward? Um, and so uh, I've been doing a very, very close reading of this text and, um, uh, and, and, and trying to understand it's a very, very, uh, it has huge implications uh, for uh, the present because uh, it's, um, as some people have described it, a profoundly anti-Muslim text. On the other hand, it completely and totally supports partition as uh, proposed by the Lahore Resolution, but its own interpretation of partition because it, uh, and, and that's very important too. So we, we, need, to, we need to understand this, uh, this book. Uh, for many reasons, it, I think it, 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 it helps us understand um, a, a very important pivotal moment in uh, our history. Okay, so in one reading of the text, uh, I read all the, the, the ideas, the political science that Ambedkar is drawing upon at, of his time. And what he is drawing upon very, very heavily is the writing on Eastern Europe in particular. Now, in Eastern Europe, at the, at the, at the end of the First World War, as the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire uh, collapsed, new nation states emerged. They were multi-ethnic empires, and so all the new nation states had massive minorities. And the League of Nations developed these minority treaties, and these minority treaties were meant to give special rights to minorities, large minorities, in all of these new nation states, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so um, minority rights has its origins in, I mean, there's a longer history uh, to minority rights, but it, it gets uh, uh, institutionalized in a very particular way in Europe. And Ambedkar, Jinnah, Muslim League speeches, they all refer to events that are happening in Eastern Europe as examples, as drawing lessons from, to understand the Indian context. They're, they're using what's happening in Europe to think about India. So this Ambedkar's text draws very heavily on this experience. And uh, the minority rights regime of the League of Nations is seen as utterly failing. Okay, it's seen as a total failure in actually protecting minority rights. And so in some ways we can begin to think about uh, the Lahore Resolution in that moment in 1940 when minority rights are seen as having failed in protecting minorities um, in, uh, the Eastern, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, these new nation states. Um, and uh, um, uh, Indian thinkers, uh, leaders are reading about what's happening there and thinking, well, this, is, this, this minority rights is not necessarily the solution. So that's one way to, 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 to place this text, right? It's really, it needs to be placed in, in, in this, this, this larger history, this global history of minority rights. Um, and uh, a, this particular moment when um, and in India they're trying to, uh, th uh, uh, they're seeing the end of empire and trying to uh, uh, um, make political claims um, in this context. Another way uh, that I also look at um, this text is uh, minority as now, we know the hostage theory um, that uh, there would be minorities in both India and in Pakistan. That's absolutely crucial to the Lahore Resolution. The thing about the Lahore Resolution is that although it's really important for arguing that Muslims are not a minority but rather a nation, 
a key piece of the Lahore resolution is holding on to minority rights. It insists that there will be minorities in both what is going, what they are, what they're calling independent states uh, for Muslims, as well as uh, uh, India. They hold on to the, the Lahore resolution holds on to insist on minority rights at the same time relinquishing uh, the claim to be minority. Right? They're saying we're not, no longer minority, we're a nation, but minority rights remain integral to it. So in a way, it's a contradictory move that the Lahore Resolution is making. And one that Ambedkar attacks, he says this is really problematic, um, holding on to minority rights. Uh, we need to actually just um, get rid of the minorities. And I look at um, uh, this idea of the internal border. Um, that um, is uh, uh, in um, uh, um, that's a problem for and and that Ambedkar's text uh, presents some way of thinking about um, um, for for minorities that that minorities represent some kind of internal border and this idea of nation is an internal category rather than an external category the inside outside of it. The part that I'm going to share a little bit more in detail, and uh, I'll try to be sort of more um, um, brief about it so that we can have more discussion and, and I talk less, um, is a section called Minority as Dissent. And in this, I try to read Ambedkar's book, Thoughts on Pakistan, in relation to Ambedkar's other writing, which is really uh, uh, important because if you just read Thoughts on Pakistan, then, then I think it doesn't fully make sense, um, especially some of the things he has to say about the figure of the Muslim in Indian history. Um, and one way to read the text is to read it alongside Ambedkar's other writing. And the most important other writing of Ambedkar's is a text called Annihilation of Caste. Um, and I'll, I'll introduce uh, a few things about that text. Um, yeah. So let me actually not uh, go into too much detail um, and, and actually just lay out uh, a briefer uh, a version of this argument. Now, um, in uh, the literature uh, on minorities today, uh, there are uh, two ways in which minorities are thought of. One, uh, there's a lot of political science literature in which minorities are a problem and solutions have to be found to that problem. And that solution is found in uh, the form of partitions, transfer of populations, um, it's found in, in forms of minority rights. But um, even in this literature, there is a con there's a concession that's made that there's no perfect solution to the minority problem. If you think of minority as a problem, there's no perfect solution to it as a problem. Another way in which uh, uh, some writing, especially anthropological writing, has thought about minorities has been as a form of incompleteness that makes majorities anxious. Majorities get very nervous because minorities represent an incompleteness of themselves, and therefore that's the reason why so much violence is carried out against minorities, because um, even though they are small, they're poor, um, seemingly no threat at all, right? But yet, because they are a reminder of this uh, incompleteness, it uh, drives um, this, what, what have become programs, what becomes genocide, what becomes ethnocide, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of thinking about minority in terms of either problem or incompleteness, um, I think this text allows us uh, uh, Ambedkar's writing, especially some of his ra more insurrectionary radical thought as a Dalit thinker, allow us to begin to think of minority not as a problem or as incomplete, but rather as a category uh, full of insurgent possibilities. 
um, I have a, a quote where um, Ambedkar and Jinnah meet, they shake hands. When Ambedkar comes to the day of deliverance, a meeting called by, rally called by Jinnah, and they, they, they are shaking hands and the biographer of Ambedkar calls this moment uh, when the two leaders belch fire. Okay, that's, that's, that's uh, Dhananjay Kier's words, belching fire. So can one think of minority as a category, as a conceptual category that belches fire? That is, it's one uh, that is conditioned by dissent. It's a for, it has a force of dissent. It has the potential of critiquing, of showing the majority, of transforming the majority, of transforming the whole. Right, like as a creative energy, right, rather than as a problem. And if you th begin to think about it as a creative energy, then uh, um, the way we respond to minority um, might be very, very different, right? We, instead of trying to find solutions to the minority problem, we might begin to embrace minority as a force that is necessary within us um, and is a part of us, as opposed to something that needs to be reconciled um, in another way. So Annihilation of Caste, right, is, is, is a very important text. Um, and uh, it was basically a speech that Ambedkar wrote uh, uh, for uh, an event in Lahore that he was invited to give a speech for. There was an organization for uh, ending, uh, 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 for the destruction of caste, uh, an Arya Samaj organization in Lahore, which had invited him to give a speech. He wrote this speech. Um, but when uh, that organization found out what the contents of the speech were, they uninvited him. Okay, so they uninvited him, and Ambedkar said, "Okay, if you're uninviting me now, because you should know who I am and what I'm going to say, now you're uninviting him." He published the speech, and he published all the correspondence uh, with this organization uh, alongside it. And Gandhi wrote some responses to. Um, uh, Ambedkar's speech, and Ambedkar also uh, published uh, Gandhi's responses, right? So when you, if you go online and you download Annihilation of Caste, you will get his speech plus all the correspondence between the organization and with Gandhi, and Ambedkar's response to Gandhi, et cetera, et cetera, part of it. Thoughts on Pakistan, as I said, he wrote in the months that followed uh, followed uh, uh, the Lahore Resolution. Now, as I said, the two texts have never been looked together, but there's one historian that has, and he considers Annihilation of Caste as an insurrectionary text, um, calling for the Annihilation of Caste, of course, um, and uh, Thoughts on Pakistan as an inflammatory text. One could argue insurrectionary and inflammatory represent a kind of um, continuum which allow us to understand the possibilities, the creative possibilities, the energy of minority uh, as dissent, as well as some of its limits in Indian political thought, and specifically Indian political thought. Um, and so um, uh, let me sort of explore a little bit more about what I mean by minority of dissent and how it works in this text. Um, let me let me backtrack to to uh, uh, um, understanding uh, some things about the annihilation of caste. Um, now, as I said, um, minority treaties was one way in which rights were given to minorities in the new nation states of Eastern Europe. Um, which were guaranteed by an outside power, the League of Nations, an external body to the nation state itself that, uh, um, uh, that uh, backed those, was the guarantor of those rights. In the Indian context, this already had a longer history because when Muslims got separate electorates, it was basically a colonial power that was the backer of, the guarantor of these rights 
for Muslims, his first sort of claim to separate rights, separate protections uh, for Muslims. And um, uh, um, uh, Muslims got separate electorates in 1909. Uh, separate electorates were then extended to, say, Sikhs by 1919. And um, ex separate electorates were, uh, were extended to all minorities in the Indian subcontinent, including Dalits, and this was really important, uh, by 1932. And this was something that Ambedkar had fought hard for. And this, of course, led to a major confrontation between Ambedkar and Gandhi. Now, I don't know how many of you are already familiar with this confrontation between Ambedkar um, and Gandhi that took place. Um, so uh, when Dalits got separate electorates, uh, like other uh, minorities, um, in 1932, uh, Gandhi undertook a fast unto death to force Ambedkar to relinquish this minority right because it meant the recognition of Dalits um, as a minority outside the Hindu majority, right? As a separate minority outside the Hindu majority. And, uh, and he instead insisted that Dalits needed to be given some kind of reservations and rights uh, within uh, the Hindu majority, not outside of it. So he wanted joint electorates for, uh, with reservations for Dalits as a way to keep Dalits as a minority within uh, the Hindu majority. Now, what is remarkable about Ambedkar's submission, because he, had to, he did submit, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't risk uh, Gandhi dying at his hands, right? So, of course, he submitted to the Mahatma's uh, stubborn, uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, Mahatma's insistence. But the way Ambedkar uh, submitted, he was quite stubborn. Um, uh, to accept this in an obedient fashion. I use the word obedient uh, 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 um, uh, with purpose. Um, he, he refused to accept this obediently, um, this inclusion, one could say, into the majority. He, um, and he gave expression to a disobedience of spirit uh, by speaking and writing about this encounter with Gandhi from, from then on right until he died. Um, and, he wrote, and he spoke always about it with a great deal of bitterness and a lot of critique of, of Gandhi. And the other way he expressed a disobedience of spirit was by announcing soon after the, the, the Pune Pact, as it was called, where he submitted to the Gandhi request. Uh, so, uh, so soon after that, he announced he was going to convert. And, and although he never converted till a few months before he died in 1956, uh, the, the announcement that he was going to convert, this was one way out of an insistence on retaining an autonomy a fierce autonomy as minority, right? This dissident power of minority holding on to that right up to the end. The full moral force of dissent uh, being absolutely crucial to his, uh, his thought. Uh, okay, so, so this, is, this, is, uh, this is the background to his writing The Annihilation of Caste. The Pune Pact has happened, he's announced he's gonna convert, and in 1936, he then writes Annihilation. Of, of, of caste. Um, now, uh, Gandhi, one could argue, was holding out to Ambedkar inclusion into the power of the majority. Um, but uh, was it a form of assimilation, a form of inclusion uh, that uh, was going to uh, lead to the ending uh, somehow of greater ending of um, um, uh, was going to allow some kind of assimilation or ending of uh, caste discrimination that or ending of untouchability that uh, uh, Ambedkar was fighting for. Now we know of course that Gandhi was utterly opposed to untouchability um, and um, for him he had a very just he had a different understanding of the caste system um, in which he saw the caste system as a non-hierarchical um, understanding of caste, um, and, um, and um, therefore what 
uh, he was offering was a form of um, uh, social change. He was offering social change. Uh, he wanted social change, but on different terms than Ambedkar's. Now, the word in European uh, uh, history uh, with minority that's used for thinking about the minority problem is the assimilation. And assimilation is what was always considered as desirable to make a, whole, na na uh, a national whole. Through assimilation, you could bring minorities uh, uh, into a national whole. One way of ending minorities as a distinct category. But that, although that word assimilation is no longer used today, um, it was um, for, there's a philosopher, Hannah Arendt, whose work I draw upon a great deal, um, who um, suggested assimilation was a kind of a false promise that was offered to minorities um, because um, you could never lose the stigma of being uh, different. Um, uh, that was already there in, in, in minoritization. What's interesting, of course, in, in the Indian context is that the word assimilation is never, never used. Um, it's not even considered a possibility, and one of the reasons why it's not considered a possibility, one way to think about it is that uh, it's a caste society. You cannot assimilate where what is already predetermined uh, by birth. And so you can have forms of Sanskritization, you can have conversion, uh, you do not have a discussion or political debate on assimilation. The word that's used instead, of course, in Indian political discourse is toleration, right? You, and, and we use that word, right? Toleration is what we need. So that's the operative word, um, a way by uh, minorities which are seen as unassimilable, so irreducibly separate, uh, to be able to live together. Toleration is the way in which minorities can live together. Minorities and majorities can live together as a social and political whole. So um, when Ambedkar attacks toleration, we need to understand why he's doing so. Right? He's attack he attacks toleration in both annihilation of caste, the main text. He also attacks toleration in response to Gandhi's uh, view on caste. He argues Hindus claim to be a tolerant people based on their ability to worship many gods and um, uh, opposing gods at the same time. But uh, I'm quoting uh, Ambedkar, he says, they are not tolerant. This spirit of toleration is merely concealment for weakness. They are too weak to oppose or too indifferent to oppose. Um, uh, and when, what he means by this is they're too weak to oppose or too indifferent to oppose structures which they know are unjust. When you have inju un un an unjust hierarchical social order and you say everyone is going to live together happily without any fundamental change in the structure of society, then this is utterly unaccept unacceptable. Now, this way of understanding, this critique of toleration, that toleration is merely a way of keeping a certain kind of hierarchy in place. You say the dominant groups will tolerate and, uh, uh, um, and you do not actually fundamentally change the structure of things. Uh, then what is the, what is the work, what's the, what's the point of toleration? The kinds of examples that Ambedkar gives are things like um, uh, the relationship between slave and master. You can, you, 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 you can say there's a, there's a good master or a bad master, but at the end of the day, he's still the master, right? So uh, you can say he's a good master, but that doesn't change the hierarchical relationship. So those are the kinds of examples that Ambedkar gives, and he says, we don't need toleration. Um, toleration is just a way of obscuring the inequality, the problem of inequality that's at the heart of minority-majority. 
Instead, he argues, of course, for annihilation. And annihilation, therefore, then carries this insurrectionary force. It is what is needed for a complete change in the social order. And that's what he needs. He wants a complete change in the social order. You must have the old body die for a new one to be born. So that's the kind of language he uses in this, in this work. And, and I think that's, that's, um, that's, that's very... Uh, it's a very powerful text to read. He also goes on to say annihilation, to actually have annihilation happen, you need extraordinary force. And uh, uh, how do you get this kind of force? How do you get the power to, to annihilate an unjust social order? Um, he uh, considers this uh, through two things. One, he says, um, and he's, you, he's, he's arguing with Gandhi on this, uh, he says, one, you need the right to, to acquire knowledge, and this is pretty self-evident, right? Of course you need knowledge um, uh, uh, in order to have independent thinking. Independent thinking is the first step to then uh, uh, seeing a, a social order and, and demanding change uh, for it. Uh, independent thinking to put a stable, uh, so um, a, a seemingly stable world into question, right? So that's that's so self-evident. But the other part that he need, that he insists that you need is courage. You need f you need courage, and and he sees this as integral to the denial to Dalits the right to be armed. Okay, so in a caste system, uh, the to knowledge is something that's denied to Dalits, but also he's arguing the right to be armed is being denied to them. And the right to be armed, why is that so important to him? And, and this is so important to him because in all his argumentation, he says that you can have independent thinking, but you need courage to fight for making ch further change. You need uh, courage, and he repeats that in relation to fighting the social order. Now, this relationship of courage to bearing arms, to have actual fighting experience, he was very proud of the fact that Dalits had been in, uh, in um, the military, in the British Indian Army. This capacity to fight in the army is something that runs through all, um, uh, almost all Indian uh, and Hindu political thought in the colonial context. Now, including Gandhi, including Gandhi sees having a fighting spirit as absolutely integral to uh, um, uh, even, for, for instance, for Gandhi, even to be a non-violent uh, activist, you need this fighting spirit, which is why he goes out and recruits soldiers for the First World War. He re recruits soldiers for the First World War because he feels that, um, that fighting by having, having fought, uh, then you can make a conscious choice not to fight. But to not fight could also be a cowardly position. So you don't want cowardice, you want courage. And how is courage to be cultivated? Courage is to be cultivated by fighting, by having fighting experience. So you make a conscious choice then to not fight. So for, for, Dal, for Ambedkar too, uh, that logic is at work. You see that in Savarkar as well. So Hindu nationalism, key texts also drop on. You need to be fighting, right? To be, become soldiers. Um, this fighting spirit has to be cultivated. It's not natural to the Hindu. Uh, in many of these, uh, for many of these thinkers, you want to discard cowardice. Cowardice is a problem. You need courage. You have to cultivate courage by taking on, be becoming soldiers by, by fighting and then renunciating fighting. So for, for Ambedkar, he's the son of a Mahar soldier, the importance of, uh, of fighting both in the British Indian Army is both a transgression of caste taboo, uh, occupational taboos, but it's the cultivation of the fighting spirit. Now this fighting spirit is really important for how we think about the other texts, thoughts on Pakistan. This is where the Pakistan idea, the Muslim question, come into play. How we 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 uh, we need to grapple with how he represents the Muslim question, the Pakistan problem in thoughts on Pakistan. 
It is in Thoughts on Pakistan that the figure of the Muslim emerges as a paradigmatic insurrectionary minority. This is where minority and the force of dissent are explored at its very limits. Um, and um, he's drawing upon, Ambedkar is drawing upon a lot of scholarship. It's a very scholarly uh, book, Thoughts on Pakistan. Um, he's drawing upon Orientalist scholarship. He's drawing upon political science. He's also collecting a lot of uh, statistical data to make his arguments. He draws upon two political, uh, sorry, two colonial concepts in making his argument. One colonial concept uh, he enforces, uh, reinforces, the other he dismantles. The one that he reinforces and the one he dismantles, I think they are both very self-consciously chosen um, as such. The Orientalist con conception of Islam as a religion of the sword is the one that he reinforces. And his entire text is rife with um, examples of Muslim invasions, um, temple destructions, and all the ways in which Muslim rule subjugated Hindus uh, and others uh, in the Indian context. So in a way, there's brute Muslim force um, at work which is uh, striving to uh, conquer not just territory and accumulate wealth, but also, Ambedkar writes, to destroy the Hindu faith. And he repeats this several times in the book. Um, and um, this is one of the reasons why, for example, Faisal Devji calls this an anti-Muslim text, because it's kind of stereotyping Muslims in, in, in this fashion as, as particularly given to violence um, and, 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 and op oppositional to uh, uh, the Hindu faith. The second colonial concept that he uses is, uh, and, and dismantles is that of martial and non-martial races. Um, and here he's quite uh, uh, impressive in collecting a lot of British Indian Army data, which was classified at the time. And he shows that 60% of the British Indian Army actually comes from uh, the Northwest Punjab and Kashmir. Um, all Muslim majority regions, um, and about a third of the Indian army is made up of Muslims, although they are only a quarter of the population. Um, so he sees Muslims as much larger in proportion uh, to the numbers uh, in the army, and um, uh, as such, uh, he, he is very critical of this idea of martial races, uh, which is very important in the recruitment policies, he says, but it's completely artificial. It's as artificial as caste. And of course, he sees Dalits and anyone else as having the capacity uh, to cultivate this fighting spirit. But he especially characterizes, he says, um, the Hindu spirit of aggression is a new phase which he has only just begun to cultivate. The Muslim spirit of aggression is his native endowment and is ancient as compared with that of the Hindu. It is not that the Hindu, if given time, will not pick up and overtake the Muslim, but as matters stand today, the Muslim in his exhibition of the spirit of aggression leaves the Hindu far behind. So here are Muslims who are, who are naturally endowed with a fighting spirit, that very fighting spirit that everyone else needs to cultivate in order to fight for a transformation of a social, an unjust social order. And this, in a way, makes, uh, makes the Muslim, the spirit of aggression, potential to make the Muslim the vanguard of the minority of dissent. Um, I won't go into further details. He gives lots of examples of the, the political consequences of the spirit of aggression. For instance, he says uh, the various Muslim political organizations were at the forefront for demanding full uh, independence from British rule when much of the Congress still wanted some kind of freedom within dominion status. Uh, and he gives lots of examples from Jamit ul Hind, the Khilafat Committee, etc., etc. So he has very detailed historical passages um, giving examples of all the ways in which this fighting spirit 
amongst Muslims, this vanguard of dissent, means that they have fought for full political freedom, they are outspoken, they are honest, they refuse to use reverential titles like the Mahatma, and so on and so forth. So on the one hand, they, they represent some kind of, uh, they represent some kind of uh, possibility, um, this energy, this, this transform uh, transformative uh, pr uh, promise which also means that as democratic self-rule comes to the horizon, the Muslim minority cannot be excluded from political power. They will refuse to be what he says are subject race. Um, and this refusal to be uh, Muslims and other minorities to become subject races in conditions of independence is something that is, is to be refused, to be rejected, is to be questioned. But this is exactly the very moment when um, Muslims are relinquishing. He's writing on, on the Lahore Resolution. He's writing Thoughts on Pakistan as a text on the Lahore Resolution. So this is precisely the moment when Muslims are claiming they're not a minority, right? The minority as dissent, this with this, with this, this dissenting force, um, this is this is this this dissenting force is a force that uh, Muslims are relinquishing in this moment to say instead of being a minority they are a nation, and here he comes out in full force in arguing that minority right to insurrection is an integral is an integral force. It is preferable to submission. He draws upon a very important, uh, um, and, and quotes extensively from this uh, text called Elements of Politics, um, which, is, which is important from 1929. Um, and um, he uses it to, to insist that insurrection is preferable to, to submission, and this right of insurrection is a check on, uh, uh, on political power. It's a, it's a form of, um, uh, uh, of maintaining, uh, 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 responding to a sense of injustice um, and, 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 and um, uh, be, a disrupt, uh, be an imp important uh, creative uh, force. But when the Muslim as nation uh, when when Muslim, Muslims now claim to be a nation, they lose the right of insurrection. They lose the creative, critical force of uh, being a dissenting minority. Um, instead, uh, Ambedkar dog dogmatically supports this Muslim claim to nation. Um, he also characterizes them as politically detachable, spiritually alien, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, in, as such, by taking away this right of insurrection, he's also placing a limit. Now, the same spirit of aggression, this 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 courage to fight, um, this courage to fight now requires a limit uh, because it's no longer an insurrectionary force. It's now um, seeking uh, 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 dominance um, as 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 nation. So you also see in this text, just at the very moment that, that Muslims lose, uh, when they declare themselves nation and they lose this insurrectionary force, this is Ambedkar's insistence, right? Because he says, like I said, minor, the Lahore Resolution itself never lets go of minority rights um, and, and uh, never sees Pakistan as something that was going to uh, uh, that was going to, um, uh, um, sorry, always sees Pakistan as something that, as, as, a, as a concept that would have to deal with both nation and with minority rights because Muslims would remain minorities um, while, while claiming nationhood in another context as well. Um, but Ambedkar's insistence that, of course, uh, we need two separate states, complete transfer of populations, um, and a homogenous Muslim nation state to emerge, he's therefore, as such, uh, cutting them off. And Muslims now bear the stigma of being a minority that once ruled India. 
Now, for a minority to have aspirations to power, to be rulers, was acceptable in the age of empires. In the age of empires, minority had no, was, 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 not, a form of, was not a form of politics. But it is utterly unacceptable, unjust, illegitimate in the age of democratic nationalism, which is now upon them. And so there is a great deal of revulsion that's mobilized against Muslim history in uh, Indian, within the larger framework of Indian history. And it's been fashioned, this revulsion against Muslim history um, uh, has been fashioned really and mobilized for this age of democratic nationalisms, right? Where, where you want to um, make a, a kind of political argument about the place of minorities in this context. So I'm going to end here uh, by suggesting that Pakistan then uh, emerges um, a, as a claim to nation is forged in Ambedkar's text um, as a relinquishing of minority, as an annihilation of minority. Uh, that's the way in which um, uh, uh, um, Pakistan emerges as a force that's going to annihilate minority. Um, and at the same time, this text is also making an argument for holding on to minority, because minority has this uh, force of dissent, it has this insurrectionary capacity that mustn't be done away with. That's integral to uh, social transformation, for building a more just society, uh, for self-knowledge, for self-understanding. Um, and uh, he constructs Pakistan in this denuded fashion as one which no longer has this capacity, no longer has that possibility, no longer has that promise of being transformatory in any, in any way other than becoming uh, 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 one, more, one more territorial nation state on the ground. So I'll stop here and see, um, I mean, I don't know if, if um, uh, how much of this meant something um, to, uh, to you and if you have any questions um, and, and see what, yeah. Um, see uh, the the minority uh, uh, the minority uh, discourse political discourse in um, colonial India was entirely um, in terms of religious identities and that's based on a colonial understanding of India itself when the British came they really saw India as made up of religious communities of different uh, an array of religious communities and so much of the ways in which they ran the administration was as if there are so many religious communities that need to be managed and controlled and counted um, and so on and so forth. So that was the, ve the most important way in which the minority category functioned. But indeed, um, you know, in, in within Pakistan, the ethnic minority has become as important, has been as important from the very get-go. Although one could say, you know, the Bengali, uh, the Bengalis as part of Pakistan were a majority which were turned into a minority, right? Um, and so um, uh, if one think, thinks of minority as a dissenting force, they were, they were just that. Um, they were a dissenting force. I'm putting that in quote marks, minority as a term not tied to merely uh, 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 numbers, but rather also in terms of political status, in terms of relationship to power, a certain kind of inequality of power, right? Um, so if you think of minority as marking a form of inequality, then yes, they were made into a minority, even though in numbers they were a majority. Yeah. Sure. Right. So what, what path would it have taken had, in your opinion, right, had, had Pakistan not been accountable? 
Um, so, um, right. Um, there's there's two ways to think about this. One, uh, look, um, with even with partition, and this was always, uh, if you if from the Lahore resolution onwards, part of the package deal. Uh, there would be Muslim minorities that would be in India, and that regardless of what, whether pa Pakistan was formed or not, right? Um, and um, much of our understanding um, of the success and failure of Pakistan um, uh, is based on our looking at the treatment of Muslim minorities in India today. So if one, if one does that, then you say, okay, um, the Muslim minorities um, are in India and they are subjected to uh, an enormous amount of um, uh, stigmatization, uh, ghettoization, and violence. Um, but uh, that has also been true of Pakistan. It's also generated minorities from the get-go. Um, and uh, created new minorities and now eth and e ethnic minorities. So the minority question has been integral to Pakistan as well, and we have also not, uh, we have also responded to the minority question in pretty similar ways, right? So that's because minority has a long history of being seen as a problem that has to be, uh, that has to be dealt with. Now, Ambedkar does a very interesting thing by saying that, look, uh, we'll have a transfer of populations, um, um, and uh, there may still be Muslims left in India. But there'll be a very small number then, and uh, this small number will not pose a, a, a problem. They, 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 will, they will respond in terms of class politics. They will align with class interests rather than see themselves as Muslim. Um, and, and he also goes into a discussion of Hindu, uh, um, the Mahasabha and Savarkar's position. And he says, well, for them, you know, this, these guys will become in, insignificant once this question goes away. But none of that happens. In fact, it doesn't matter if the numbers are small or big. Uh, the question of, of um, uh, seeing minorities as a threat uh, as a problem remains, and you can you can you can see that sometimes uh, with great intensity in Pakistan, where where some of our minorities are are in numbers very small, but also in terms of um, um, you know um, some of the poorest sections of of our society, and and yet we we uh, the political discourse fears them, treats them as a threat, as a problem and there's a lot of violence directed against them. So um, I think it's a question of also, and that's why I'm trying to think about minority as a creative force, as a dissenting force, as, as something that we need for self-understanding continuously. There will always be a minority. Uh, you, you get rid of one kind of minority, you create another kind of minority, right? There's always some, someone is always a minority in a room full of people. Okay, because, and that's just a fact.